there is a group of people professing to know Jesus Christ and to live for him, but they're traveling in the broad way when they think they're in the narrow way and they have these signs on them dead to the world, but the people in the world say there's no difference. We dress, we talk, and we act alike. So we're going to get right into our topic, our first topic for this evening. Uh, so just for by raise of hands, how many of us grew up Seventh-day Adventists? We were born into the Seventh-day Adventist message. All right, quite a few of us. And for those who were not born into the church, how were you introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, I was actually introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist church by my mom's friends. Um, being that we grew up Baptist, my mom had a lot of friends that were Seventh-day Adventists. And one time we were actually invited to a revival, and we went to church every single day. And as we went, uh, I was just like, okay, why are we going to church every day? And my mom came up to us, and she's just like, okay, so do you guys want to be a Seventh-day Adventist? And she was contemplating baptism. And in my mind, I was just like, uh, I don't want to go to church every day, Mom, so I don't think I want to be an Adventist. But by and by, the Holy Spirit started to work upon me, and I was just like, okay, Mom. So I gave up my earrings. I willingly gave up everything that I knew that really wasn't up to par with the Seventh-day Adventist message. And then we started on our journey. Um, for me, I was introduced into the Adventist church. Um, it's quite interesting because in the book of 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Be not equally um, yoked with unbelievers. And my parents, my mother is actually Adventist, my dad's Catholic. What a, con um, what, you know, what a mix there. And, you know, growing up, my, I grew up pretty much Catholic up until sixth grade. So I remember, well, up to like seventh or eight, seven or eight years old, and I remember, you know, just going to mass, doing different things. But when I was a little bit older, my mom decided to begin to be Adventist again. So at that age, I really didn't understand it. But I just went because, hey, my mom's going to church, so I'm going to go. Um, but that's how I was introduced to it. It's by and by, my mom ended up turning back to the faith, and I was introduced to it. Now, was there a difference between your denomination and the Seventh-day Adventist message? I would say at first being that when I did grow up Baptist and came into Seventh-day Adventism, at first there was no true difference because I take the context of holidays, for instance. In a Baptist church, you don't really celebrate Halloween. You have fall festivals. So you'd have the fall festivals, you play the bowling with the pumpkins and all that stuff, and then you'd have your Christmas plays and programs and things like that. But as I came into the Adventist church, those things were still prominent. Those things were still there. And I can remember at my old church, I was in charge of the cotton candy stand. I'd be making the cotton candy, giving it to people, passing out prizes and things like that. And um, we had Christmas plays. I would be singing in the Christmas plays and mm. being an angel and things like that. So there was actually no true difference. I didn't see the line of distinction when it came to that. I was just like, okay, mom. So pretty much, I guess we're just still Baptist in a sense. We just go to church on Saturday. Wow. Um, for me, there was definitely a marked difference. Um, going to being Catholic and going to a Catholic school and participating in their programs. The one thing that I always remember was confessional. Um, I actually went to a confessional one time and it was interesting because at such a young age it was like the Holy Spirit was letting me know this is not right. And I remember going to the confessional and the priest is on the other side of the mesh um, partition and I'm like I can see you. I can clearly see that you have glasses on. You got gray hair. Like this is not there's no privacy here. And I remember you know unfortunately at the time I lied and said something silly like oh I stole candy or something because I just felt a conviction in my heart at that age like this is not right. Like why am I telling someone else my sins? And I never really read the Bible because in the Catholic Church they don't make you read the Bible in their schools. And I remember every May we would pray to Mary. So we would, all the students would gather and we'd walk the streets and we had a statue, which is actually still there till today because I visited New York and I saw it there. And we would pray to the Mary statue. So there was definitely a difference. Being Adventist, I remember, you know, on Fridays we couldn't do things. And I would, it, I'd feel weird. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I want to watch my cartoons. So it was actually hard to transition because I was still in Catholic school while my mom was trying to do, um, trying to um, practice Adventism. So it was a lot of confusion growing up. So again, what we're talking about is we're talking about being in the church, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church, whether we have grown up 
into the Seventh-day Adventist church because our parents were a Seventh-day Adventist, or we were brought into the faith later on in life, as Jomana and Jerby just shared their testimony on that. So now, what was it that kept you at the local Seventh-day Adventist church that you attended? I have to definitely say for myself, growing up Adventist, what kept me at my church, I'd have to say, was friends and positions. Because being at a church where you were, where you were for years, we were doing a lot of things. I was in ushering. I was ushering. I was in the choir. I was an adventurist, different things like that. And I was unwilling to go to another church where, number one, I didn't know anyone. I was a total stranger. And I wasn't doing anything at all. So that was one of the things that kept me at, I, at my local church. And as for me, I was in my previous church since I was about three, three years old. So it was the people I knew since I was a child, even to this day, that kept me at the church. And the interesting thing is, for 23 years, I sat in a church where I didn't understand a single word the preacher was saying. And the reason is because the church is a, um, a Haitian Creole French church. And unfortunately, I don't understand my own um, I can't understand fully my, uh, my own language, unfortunately. And through that, of course, you can see the messages had nothing to do with why I was at the church. But even at that time, the youth, all of us have said for many years that the church is dead, even the ones who understood what was being said. So what kept me was the people that I knew since I was a child, and it was that fellowship. Now, uh, the other thing that, one thing that kept me at the church that I was attending uh, in Florida was simply the love. How many of you have ever been to a Seventh-day Adventist church where the people, they just love you till you can't get any more love? <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the churches I was attending. It was so loving. I mean, you'd walk in the door, everyone's smiling, they, they uh, tell you their name and everything. You feel so welcome. And as I was attending the church, literally, that was the only chord keeping me there because the messages were weak. I wasn't hearing anything that was heart convicting. I wasn't hearing anything that was new, in a sense, because the Bible is more than just the four, than four books. It's more than just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all we were hearing was, you know, Christ died on the cross. He loves you. I understand that, but what more in the Bible can I have? What other truths am I to be receiving right now that will prepare me for Christ's second coming? But what kept me at that church was simply the love. And again, we're talking about the church, our experiences from being in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So now we're going to talk about what is the condition of the youth in the Seventh-day Adventist church today. Now, I remember my times back in my old church before I knew the present truth, the condition of the youth. There was many times we couldn't wait until the Sabbath day was over. Unfortunately, that's the case. That is the condition of the youth today. We couldn't wait until it was over to go to maybe the corner store, to go to the movies, whatever it might be. And the Bible highlights this state, this condition that I was in, that God continue, continually keeps me from. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, I'm just going to go ahead and quote it. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This was the condition of the church. And I remember many times we would say, we're Adventists. We will say, this is the truth. Many of my friends, we say, we know the Sabbath day is the right day, not Sunday. Yet we couldn't wait until the Sabbath was over. This is sadly the condition of the youth today. Now, as for me, there is a scripture in the book of Judges, chapter 21, that clearly defines for me the condition of the youth in the church as I was seeing what was going on. In the book of Judges, chapter 21 and verse 25, Judges 21 and verse 25, the word of God says there, in those days there was no king 
in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. <laughs> what I saw from growing up in the church was I saw a transition. When I was growing up, it started off, we go to church on the seventh day because it is the Sabbath. We're not supposed to do certain things on the Sabbath. We're supposed to keep it holy. But then it moved on to we just attend church on Saturday. If I made it to church, I'm good. Then it transitioned to attending church on the seventh day sometimes. I can miss a week, a month, but as long as I come sometimes to church, I'm okay. And now it's transitioned for many of the youth as I don't have to attend church on the seventh day. I just have to know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. And that transition I have seen. And what I've noticed is that especially when youth begin to become of college age, when they're away from their parents, that's when they begin to let loose, if you will. I've seen as I was in college that many a times my roommates, my friends, Seventh-day Adventists would stay home, not go to church, sleep in bed, and then they would hang out with their other friends that were not Seventh-day Adventists, playing video games, buying food on the Sabbath, playing basketball, doing all these different things that are not Sabbath appropriate, but knowing that the seventh day is the Sabbath is what they're hanging on to. And in that condition, they're trying to evangelize, if you will. Oh, you should become a Seventh-day Adventist. And the other people who are not Seventh-day Adventists are saying, well, literally, I've heard this out of their mouth. There's no difference between us. You just go to church on the seventh day. And when I heard that, that struck me in my heart, and I knew that something, something has to be done. This is sadly the condition of many of the youth in our churches today. And the reason why this is that condition is because of some false teachings. So what are some of the false teachings that have crept into the Seventh-day Adventist church? Um, well, in my previous church, a big doctrine was the love Jesus doctrine. Jesus everything. As long as I have Jesus' love, I'm okay. And I've personally seen the effects of this doctrine in my life. My best friend's father, now he was a fervent man, a prayer, man of prayer. He loved studying his Bible. But ever since he started to attend my old church, we so, slowly see the light. Um, dim out of his light, out of his eyes till there was no more light. He went from wanting to study the Bible to saying that I don't need to study the Bible anymore. I have enough. I don't need to know anything anymore. And he does not even want to hear about Bible study. So this, these doctrines that are flying around, such as the Love Jesus doctrine, because of the church's lack of study, is choking out our brightest lights. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other issues isn't so much of what is being preached, but what isn't being emphasized in our churches as well. And that is victory over sin. And we all know this very well. And I remember a time when a friend of mine, she called me, she was from my old church, and she asked me to do a Bible study with a friend of hers who believed that she can be homosexual and Christian at the same time. So we had this Bible study, and I was just explaining how we all have a desire, this, our flesh desires for things that are not of God. And I, as I explained, I told her that we do not have to give in to the lust of the flesh. We can have victory in Jesus Christ. After the Bible study, it was my friend from my old church who said she has not really heard something like that before. She did not know she could have victory over sin. And that is a very sad reality in our churches today. They are not emphasizing victory over sin or they're preaching that there's no way we can have victory over sin. And that is very sad. But the Bible says in Romans 1 and verse 16 that the gospel is the power to save those who believe. Jesus Christ has the power to save me and to save you from whatever the sins you might have in your own heart, to trust in him and have faith, to have victory. 
I would say it's not the just the false teachings that have entered the church because there is many of them, but even the false form of worship that I noticed when I began to um, be in Adventism. I remember I used to go to a local church in Orlando, and this church was a young people church. Like everyone that went, because it was by the University of Central Florida, so everyone that was there was between the ages of 18 to I would say no more than 35. And the first thing I noticed was their um, praise team, as they would call it, and it was like a concert, literally a concert, you know, and I, I can't lie at that time because I wasn't firm in the truth. I began to have that feeling worship, like, oh, I feel good. This song makes me want to cry. It makes me feel great, and this, this mer the sermon would come, and it's just like, okay, I'm, I kind of want to leave now. You know, I just come for the music, and that's the issue, the music that they're bringing into the church. There's nothing wrong with praising God in music. That's one of the most powerful forms of worship, but when you bring in the worldly music, the drums, and the sentimental feelings, and I remember one time they had a like a revival weekend and it was at the University of Central Florida. They were able to rent a room and I go to this location and the room is dark. And I'm like, okay, like I can't see anything. How do I get in this room? And I look to the front of where the presenter would have been and the lights are dim with spotlights and different colors. And I'm like, okay, is this a nightclub or is this a Sabbath service? It's like the world was coming into the church and they had a speaker come who was a poet, but he was like rapping. Um, it wasn't even God's word. It was like just his feelings with his relationship with God. So it's not just the false teachings that have crept into the church, but it's also the false form of worship. And the book of First John chapter two, if we could all turn there. First John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So despite how those songs make you feel, if they're worldly songs, you cannot have God's love in you, and it's a false form of worship. Now, we want to touch on this next um, question and as we're talking about just now the false teachings that have crept into the church something very important that is not emphasized and many Adventists do not believe in anymore is Ellen White what we have seen is the unimportance of Ellen White has been creeping into the church and now it's in the open so what was your attitude towards the spirit of prophecy well, I can say being that as we started to come into Seventh-day Adventist Church, we didn't really know about Spirit of Prophecy. Um, as we started to hear the name Ellen G. White, my mom was just like, okay, so why are they always talking about Ellen G. White? Why are they acting as if she's God? You know, we're always putting her in the forefront, always quoting her script, quoting her words and things like that. I'm just like, you know what? That's so true. Like, why are they acting like she's God? And I started to have the negative sentiments towards her as well. And... I didn't know that that the words that she spoke had so much light in them. I didn't know that she was our prophet. And being that I came into the church, you'd think that as a new convert that they teach you these things. But as I came in, I'd had no knowledge on it whatsoever. And I remember a time I was in college and I was talking with uh, an acquaintance there and somehow we got on the conversation of Ellen White. And I just remember that he was bashing Ellen White saying that People who follow Ellen White, they believe that she's above the Bible, and she's a fanatic, and she's this, she's that. Mm -hmm. And I just had to stop and think. As I was listening to all that he was saying, something struck me. I asked him, I said, have you ever read Ellen White? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. And that is also one of the conditions of many people in the church, whether they be adults or youth, is they have not read the books of Ellen G. White, but they have so much ideas. Mm -hmm and their own opinions on who she is. And as I was sharing with him, I said, well, in the book of Isaiah, chapter eight and verse 20, the word of God says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So I said, the testimony we know because of Revelation chapter 19 is the spirit of prophecy. So if you're talking against that, there is no light in you. And Ellen White says in Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 98, paragraph 2. She says, I know your danger. If you lose confidence in the testimonies, you will drift away from Bible truth. 
The two are connected. And sadly, because people have not read the books for themselves. I, I told the gentleman, read the books for yourself, and then you can have your own opinion. But to have opinions and have not read the books, you're not speaking according to the law and to the testimony. So now, as we're speaking briefly on the subject of Ellen G. White, because she is the Lord's messenger in these last days, why is it so important for us, not just the adults, but the youth, everyone in the church, to read both the Conflict of the Asia series and the nine volumes of the Testimonies. And just briefly, for those who do not know what the Conflict of the Ages series is, it is five books from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, The Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and The Great Controversy. So why is it important for us to read these books? Now, one of the reasons why it's important to read these books is because they steer us away from fanaticism. There's a lot you can read from the word of God and misinterpret, and there's a lot you could read from the spirit of prophecy and misinterpret. And I remember one time um, there was an issue. I forgot who it was, but someone uh, in the group, they were complaining that someone killed a bug, that one of us squish the bug. And that is one thing that is often misunderstood. People, we believe that we cannot, we should not kill a bug. But it, I remember that day, Jared, he just walked by and he said, actually, in the spirit of prophecy, um, Sister White speaks of if there are pests that are bothering you, it's okay to go ahead and, and uh, kill the bug, for lack of better words. So that's just a small example, but imagine how much greater that can be to turn into fanaticism. And I'm sure, being in present truth, we have seen a lot of this happen in our own churches, whether it comes to food, whether it comes to dress. Here um, on Tell It to the World, we've learned that, you know, there's a notion that you, when you dress modestly, that you dress in a sense, what's a good word? Bummy or frumpy, as we like to say. Um, but that is not true. The, the, our dress is an um, uh, index of our characters. Jesus Christ wears a robe of righteousness. Job says, he hath clothed me with a robe of righteousness, a bright shining robe, not for display, but to show the character. Now, there has to be balance. Either we have a, it's not that we either we have a character of complete um, um, humility, so-called, or um, being, um, the complete opposite, being showy, but we must be in the middle. We must be balanced individuals, and that's why the spirit of prophecy is important. Amen. For me, the spirit of prophecy is important because the Bible tells me that is what will also be used to determine whether I am a saint of God. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, and have the faith of Jesus. But not only that, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, it also says, one moment. Yeah. Um, in the book of Revelation, it also says, 12, 17, it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here I see that in order to be a saint of God, I need the testimonies. I need Ellen G. White's writings. And of course, with that, I need God's word. And the two blended together is how God will be able to look at me and say, here is Jomana. Here is she that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimonies of Jesus. So, you know, as young people were told, oh, Ellen G. White is outdated and you don't need a heed to her writings anymore. She's old school. But one thing I've learned from the transition of being a worldly to coming to this truth and following her counsel, I have avoided so much, um, I would say, bad situations because her counsel has led me, even though she wrote it in the 1800s, till now, the, tw the 2000s, it is very current for me. And a lot of times we think only the older people should read it, but as young people, it is imperative that we read Ellen G. White's writings. There's so much we could avoid in this world if we would read her writings. She speaks about the music. She speaks about the dress. She speaks about the relationships. All these things that we deal with now, Ellen G. White speaks about and she makes it clear as to how we are to walk when we go down these paths. Amen. And for that reason, as Jomana was just speaking about, that is why 
as Tell It To The World, we have been reading these books, the five books in the Conflict of the Ages series, along with the nine volumes of Testimonies for the Church. And even the name itself, Testimonies for the Church, it's not to the church, it's for the church. So if you are part of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, we need to be reading these books because it helps us not only to steer away from fanaticism and also to know how to live our life, but also to fight off these various winds of doctrine. If we're reading the books, we would understand that just preaching Jesus' love is not enough in these last days. If we're reading the books, we would understand the present truth for the hour. And in every age, as you look throughout the Bible, every age there was a prophet. So in this time, God has given us a prophet. And where there is no vision, the people perish. So we need the writings of Ellen G. White. Amen? Amen. Now, again, we're speaking about the church. Our trans our, we're talking about the church and how we have been born into the church or how we have come into the church and how being in the Seventh-day Adventist church has affected our lives. So we're going to ask now, when did you realize that you were not at the right local Seventh-day Adventist church? Um, for me, I want to start off with reading 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and verse 4. And it reads, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that's what ha was happening at my old church. My family and I had to realize that we are not being spiritually fed. This my teeth. Um, the leaders at our church had turned their ears from the truth. They were building up the church in vanity and filling up the church with souls, but the souls were empty souls. And that was what our family and I were until we had to realize that in order for us to go to heaven, we had to go and leave and go somewhere where our souls would be fed, where we would be prepared to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I actually experienced that I was in the wrong church, the wrong SDA church, through an experience that I had. One of the last Sabbaths that we were at my old church, the pastor, a new pastor that had been there for about a year and a half, he had an idea and he proposed it in a business meeting. And he said to the congregation, he said, what do you all think of me bringing in drums? And everyone was kind of shocked, like, why would you do something like that? It's never been that way before. Mm -hmm. So he realized that he'd failed there. Then he tried to target the youth. He said, I'm sure you all like fast beat hip hop kind of music. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you all would want drums in, you know? If you want it, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. And every single youth in that church stood up and said, no, we're not gonna allow that to come in because it never was like that. It's unbiblical. We can't have it that way. And he was very angry, so angry to the point that he balled his hand up in a fist, pointed it at the parents and said, it's because of the way you raised them that they're like this. And that just led me to realize that how can a church stand if there's discord within the church? And that just brings me back to Amos 3 verse 3, can two walk together lest they agree? Amen. And I'd say for me, when I realized I was not in the right church was based on a text. Okay, so there was this text going around talking about how Pope Francis was coming and how he was going to be in a joint session with com Congress and things like that. And everybody was kind of getting worried. Everybody's getting scared and like, oh no, it's going to pass a Sunday law. And somehow that text got to my pastor. And at the end of the sermon, he stopped and he said, okay, you know what? Please don't send me stuff like that because... Um, that's just fanatic and it's a false sense of urgency and things like that and then he actually stopped and said you know they've been talking about Jesus coming ever since I was a little kid my grandma's been telling me about it and I know Jesus is coming but it's like calm down and things like that and I was just like whoa what just happened like you're trying to calm down people from their sense of urgency yes it may have been like oh my goodness like the Sunday law is coming right now right now but 
we have to be awakened to see the things that are coming upon us. We see the times that we're living in. We're living in perilous times. And a verse that I turn to is Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 27. And it says, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off. So these are basically the words that my pastor was speaking at that time. He's basically saying, you know what, these, Jesus is coming, but not anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And it was really a, appalling to me. I was just so repulsed. I was just like, what in the world is going on? And that also reminds me of a verse in Luke, Luke chapter 19, verse 20, 46. And it actually says, saying unto them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Where people are trying to be aroused, where people are starting to, slowly but surely, the scales are being ripped off of their eyes and they're seeing how Christ is coming soon, but yet he wants to fluff their pillow and tell them, go back to sleep, it's okay. Now, the time that I realized I was not in the right local Seventh-day Adventist church was one Sabbath I went to church and the pastor began to play a video <laughs> in the church. And this video had nothing to do with God at all. I mean, this video was this man, there was people on a hill and this man on the hill took his shirt off, he was dancing and it was talking about how um, once one person does something crazy, other people will follow in if you continue to do it. So then other people started dancing on the hill and the pastor tried to make some spiritual application saying how it's like the dancing is like the walk of life. As long as you're counting the steps, you haven't learned how to dance. And then he began to name some things. As long as you're counting, oh, I don't eat pork. Oh, I don't read the spirit or oh, I read the spirit of prophecy and all these things that are pillars of our faith, some of them, I began to realize there's something wrong with this message. He says, you need to let loose and dance. So then he tells the man in the back, hit it. And he plays salsa music, authentic salsa music in the church. And the pastor of the church gets down and starts dancing literally in the church. And when I saw that, I was appalled. I mean, the prayer happened after the sermon, and I couldn't even close my eyes and join in with a prayer like that to God. And that's when I got up and I realized this is not the right place to be if I'm looking for the second coming of Jesus. And after I left, I did not attend that church again for service. And now I want to read this statement because what we are not doing is calling people out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. In the book of John chapter 10 and verse 27, Christ himself says, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. So Christ is speaking through messengers today. And as we hear his voice, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, unadulterated, that is where we need to be. In the book of volume nine of the testimonies, page 48, paragraph one, Sister White says something very interesting. She says, let church members bear in mind that the fact that their names are registered on the church books will not save them. They must show themselves approved of God, workmen that need not be ashamed. So wherever God is speaking through his messengers, as you are studying the word of God, reading the spirit of prophecy, asking the Holy Spirit for light, he's going to lead you and guide you to the right place where you should be. Amen? Amen. And now what we're going to do is transition to our second topic for the evening. We just discussed our experiences from being in the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, whether we were born into the church or came in later on in life. And now what we're going to talk about is our transition to accepting and believing the present truth. Now, what is the present truth? Some may be wondering. Well, in early writings, page 63, paragraph 1 and 2, in early writings... 63, paragraph 1 and 2, it explains for us what is present truth. 
There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flocks needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth, but such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. Amen. Amen. So Sister White here, this is one of the statements where she defines what the present truth is. She says subjects such as the sanctuary message, such as the 2300 days prophecy, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are subjects upon which we must be dwelling in these last days to perfect our character for Christ's second coming. So now, what was it that led you to present truth, and how did that transition affect your life? I remember, I remember, um, I ran across Pastor Andrew Henriquez's sermons and other present truth speakers online, and I remember hearing for the very first time someone talking about how Pope Francis is going to declare the next year the year of Jubilee. That was the first time I've ever heard something like that, which is present truth. And at that same time, I was in my previous church. And I remember I was sitting down in church and they had a guest speaker. And this guest speaker, it was a, I believe it was men's ministry. And he was just talking about his life and what he did throughout the week. I don't even remember what he was talking about, but as I listened to that preacher, I remembered what I saw online, and I thought to myself, this man is talking about what he did throughout the week while the Catholic Church and the papacy is about to take the world by storm. And from then, I had this hunger for the truth. And I praise God for the word, because in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled and i praise god i am in present truth today i have been filled filled and that's a promise even to every single person who right here right now might be in the valley of decision whether they should sit, stay and sit listening to a preacher teaching them lies god promises if you're hungry you shall be filled amen and the only way you're going to be filled is not if you're sitting down in a church where they're giving you what, whatever it is other than the word of God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What led me to the present truth was um, a sincere need for change in my heart. When I began to take my spiritual life seriously, I knew that there were certain things that need to change in my life. And I was going to a previous Adventist church, um, actually the same church that Jerby and Jared used to go to, and I you know, witnessed the same experiences that we were in a place where there was young people, so it was fun to be around that, but the messages and the preacher was not truly giving God's word, and more so was teaching false doctrines, keeping the people asleep. And I remember my friends who are actually sitting in the front here inviting me to their baptism at Safe to Serve. Mm -hmm. And this is why I was still at the previous church. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to go. It's really, really far. But the Holy Spirit kept nagging at my heart. You know, Jamana, just go. You know, you're going to this church. You know you're not being fed. And you're just going there because of the love, because they're so loving. And you've built relationships. And I went to Safe to Serve that Sabbath. I'll never forget it. And um, when I got there, Pastor had already began, began his ser sermon. And as I was sitting there, I literally was sitting with my mouth open, like, because it was like my, my ears were finally hearing a good tune. It was finally like, wow, I can hear now. And the Sabbath before, my previous pastor, for some reason, gave me the Five Conflict of the Ages series book, which he never preaches on Ellen White, never speaks on her, and he gave me those books as a baptism gift because I did um, end up getting baptized there. And then I went to Save to Serve the next Sabbath, and I never went back to my old church again. I've been at Save to Serve since, and I praise the Lord for, you know, allowing people to come into my life to bring me to truth. And not only that, it affected my life in such a positive way because today I can sit here and testify to you all how great God is to bring me to truth and lead me here to this point. 
Um, likewise, I was led to present truth by um, the messages from Save to Serve, but at first I was afraid of the change, so I closed my heart to the message. You know, I did not want to leave the church that I was previously because of those cords, of those connections with my friends and with the environment. But since one day I decided to give it a try, let me just listen to that message. And from that message, my heart was convicted. I was like, wow, I'm not living the right way. I'm not going to heaven this way. And I remember that I was like, I have to change. And I decided to take on the reforms, but they were not easy. I, the hardest reforms to t overcome was dress reform and health reform. Now, health reform, I, the last thing I ever left was dairy. The last thing I ate was a rich cheese crackers. Those were my favorite <laughs> snacks in the world. I was like, I'm never going to leave those for anything. But. <laughs> But what helped me was um, Hebrews 6, verse 6, where it says that as you continue to sing, you are crucifying him afresh. And I had to, to um, talk to myself, like, is eating this Ritz crackers or what dress before my favorite outfit was jeans and a t-shirt? I hated skirts. I thought I would never wear one ever. But those two things, I had to think, is this worth sinning? Is this worth putting Christ through the same pain over again? I said, no, it's not worth it because I want to go to heaven. So I prayed to God and he gave me the victory and to this day I still continue the reforms. I am a vegan and I do dress the way I am now every day. Amen. One thing that led me to present truth was actually a sermon that Pastor Enriquez had preached at a camp meeting in 2011. Now although I had grown up Adventist, I never really practiced it because I just thought okay well I go to church every day so I'm good, I'm perfect. But it never really worked that way. And pastor was preaching about the latter rain and he compared that to the Israelites when they had to wake up early in the morning and gather manna to eat for their meal or else by noontime by sunrise it would have been melted and he said that's the same thing that we have to do we have to get up early in the morning and allow God to feed us from his word so that we can be prepared for that latter rain and so that next morning I said you know what that's what I'm going to do I'm going to wake up and I'm just going to try to study my Bible and really pull something from it so I got up that morning, I took my notes that I had taken the previous day, and I went through it. And it took a lot, because I wasn't used to it. But as I kept going over it, I did pull something from it. And thankfully, ever since then, I've been on this journey to just allow God to build me up and to make me more into his likeness. And I can say for me that <laughs> when I was led into present truth, it was actually by the influence of my best friend, Lauren. And I can honestly th say that I praise God for her because at the time, as I was going to the other church that I was going to, I was like caught up into it. I was enjoying everything that I had there. I've been desiring to be a part of the praise team, you know, to finally sing up there in the, in the front. And I was just like, you know, I don't think I want to give this up, but... You know, as I started to see the twofold witnesses that Pastor was talking about, yes, you have the word of God, but how is it true in your life? What is it doing for you? And as I saw the light of God reflecting on her, seeing the things that were changing within her, you know, the things that we used to do together, we couldn't do anymore. And I was just like, uh, why are you being so fake? You know, like, what are you doing right now? But I saw that it was truly God converting her heart. And that was a witness to me. And I was just like, okay, Lord, so you're changing her. You know, this is good. Okay, so I guess I'm going to try to do this too because, you know, she's my best friend. I don't want to lose her, so I'm going to do what she does. Mm -hmm. But praise God, it was for a good thing, you know, and he led me into this truth. And that's why um, so much more it's important that pastor is preaching these messages, you know, by showing the twofold witness, by showing the word of God and what it's actually doing in your life to help others because we have a message to share and not many people are sharing it. And also how um, present truth has specifically affected my life um, is by my testimony. Um, some of us, many of us have already heard it, but I have always been encouraged to keep sharing my testimony. And as we share our testimonies, the devil will be defeated. And it was on the point of health reform that God had saved me through the present truth. Um, because I've, I'll, I'll just start off with this. Last year, it was last year, I weighed 383 pounds. Not only that, being 23 years old at the time, I had high blood pressure, hypertension, and I had issues with my kidney as well as issues with my liver. And this was all because 
not only a lack of temperance, but also because of the principles um, of health reform that I did not know. I didn't know, for, for example, for a long time being in the Adventist church, I knew I wasn't supposed to eat shrimp. I knew I wasn't supposed to eat pork. That was pretty much the extent of it. I didn't know we should stay away from meat. I didn't know we should stay away from dairy. Sadly, that is the condition of many of our churches today. But I praise God, as you can see me now, after following health reform, that right now I could stand before everyone. Right now, all of us, I'm sure we all had issues with our health. I praise God that through a plant-based lifestyle, we can be here not only speaking truth and speaking life, but we have life within our own hearts, physically and spiritually. I praise God for that. And I want to encourage everyone here that through present truth, God wishes that you may prosper in health even as thy soul prospers. Amen. 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 So again, we're talking about our transition from gr growing up into the Seventh-day Adventist church or coming into the church later on in life now to being in the present truth and how that has affected our life. So now that you attend a true self-supporting church, what are people's reactions to you not being in the conference? Um, I like this question. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I first began going to Safe to Serve, before I even started, the people at our old church used to discourage us so much, like, don't go to the devil's corner. Oh, that pastor on the other side of town is so smart because he has people so afraid, and there's nothing there. All he does is condemn people. And, you know, when I actually started going there myself, people began to talk bad about me. I actually got the membership from my church. They made a list with all um, the people's names on it. They spelled my name wrong um, on the list, and they said, these people got the membership and I was like well praise the Lord because I knew that by going to say to serve I truly began to receive conversion it wasn't just a, oh I'm going here because my friends led me here I truly began to have a spiritual change but in the book of Mount of Blessings it tells us blessed are ye when men shall revile you which is Matthew 5 verse 11 and this right here gives me encouragement it says while slander may blacken the reputation it cannot stain the character. Amen. That is in God's keeping. So long as we do not consent to sin, there is no power, whether human or satanic, that can bring a stain upon the soul. A man whose heart is stayed upon God is just the same in the hour of his most afflicting trials and most discouraging surroundings as when he was in prosperity. So even though I was in a discouraging place, because I remember one time I called um, the pastor's mom, I was crying because I had encountered some from my old church and they were like, oh, you wear skirts now and all oh, this and that. And I, at that time I was so weak in the faith and I called her to pray with her and she was saying, you know, don't be discouraged because you are on the right path. You're seeking to change to be better for God and they can't handle the light that is within you. So what they're going to do is try to dim it. Don't let them dim that light. And from then I realized no matter what a person says, how much they may revile you. Oh, why did you come here today? Why are you watching this on YouTube? Why are you eating this way, dressing this way? They cannot change your character despite what they say and the bible tells us you know that the body they can kill but the, the flesh is still there you know fear him who can kill the soul and not the body so we cannot allow those who say why you start to be in this truth affect us because truthfully if your character is true that's what matters in the end Amen. now as for me some of the reactions that i got from not being in a conference. I was talking with one of my friends from high school, and I remember sharing the truths that I was learning here at Safe to Serve and the importance of being aware of these current events. And what he said to me was, be careful, be careful. I talked with my mom, and uh, it's not with a conference. You got to be careful. And what's interesting is that I've seen a s change in position from the time that I first met him until now. Because when I first met him in high school, his family, and his family still does, but him personally, they would keep the counsels of Ellen G. White. I remember seeing him, and he was uh, very sheltered, very kept to himself. And he was vegan. He was doing this and doing that. But then in high school, I noticed a change came about him because of the peer pressure, because oftentimes he was standing aloof. I remember while we were engaging in um, competition games, 
Oftentimes, he wouldn't come. His parents would allow him to come because of the competitive sports. And it always stuck in my mind. I never understood why, because at the time, I wasn't reading the book, so I didn't know. But as we got on later in high school, he began to participate in these events. And even now, he's out of the church, if you will. He's coming to church every now and then, but every picture that I see of him on Facebook, you know, he's, he, he likes to work out. So he's, you know, showing those muscle pictures and things. And he's, he's not vegan anymore. He's kind of backtracking. And yet we have almost switched roles because now I'm reading the books from Ellen White. And I'm changed. God has allowed me to change my diet and so on and so forth. And all he can tell me is to be careful. Every time I talk to him, he's like, oh, you're always talking about the Bible. Oh, I know you, what you're going to say, blah, 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 <laughs> things like that. And it's sad because to see that one person who was once abiding by the truth and now isn't, that really hurts my heart. And that is one response that I get from people saying, um, beware of a church not being in the conference. There's much more persecution, and we're going to keep talking about this. Again, we're talking about our transition to being in present truth and accepting the present truth, how it has affected our life. So now, since, how, since you are in the present truth, how now is your relationship with your family and friends since coming into the truth? Well, I can say for me, in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 29, it actually says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. As I was reading this verse, I'm, I was backtracking on my life and thinking back. I was just like, okay, Lord, so... You know, I've given up a lot to be able to be here today. I've given up a lot to be able to receive this truth that I have now. And I'm thinking back and seeing all the things that I've gone through, through the bad relationship with my mom and my family members calling me a fanatic and making fun of me because I don't eat pork or, oh, you can't eat this jerby. This has pork in it. So, you know, I'm sorry for you and things like that. And it actually ruined my relationship with my family in a sense. I was just like, okay, Lord, so my family's completely against me. But I see that in this verse, you're telling me that if I give up all these things, that you'll be able to give me everlasting life. You'll give me everything that I need. Mm -hmm. And the family that I once had that I thought was so close to me that has completely like just pushed me off. But slowly but surely, I see that God is slowly bringing them back to a return and the point that which my life can be a witness to them, that it can be a testimony to them. And not only that, but he's given me a new family. He's given me my brothers and sisters that are up here today, my family that's back there. He's given me a family that is pushing towards the same goal that I am. I want to go to heaven. I know that Christ is coming soon. And I have family members that are right here that are pushing towards the same thing. I'm praising God for that. Amen. Amen. I know for myself, family and different friends, they don't understand this work. They don't understand why not only myself, but each and every one of us here, and even many of those within the congregation that do present, that do evangelism, do what we do. You know, they look at me and they say, why aren't you in college? How, how is this full-time ministry gonna pay for the bills? You know, that's, that kind of work isn't reliable. You can't do it all your life. You gotta get a job. You gotta, do something where you can be honorable. You can have a high position. And, you know, sometimes you can answer, you can reply, but sometimes you just have to ignore because, once again, they don't understand. And when you look back on the account of Christ, his family, his brothers, and his mother many times didn't understand why he did what he did, why he was about his father's business. And I know that in due time, God will do his work and he will impress their hearts on that work. But for myself and us up here and everyone within the congregation as well. We just have to keep about our father's business. What is the relationship that I have with certain friends and family members after coming into this truth? I'm going to start off with this scripture in the book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. When you have it, please say amen. Matthew 10, verse 37. The word of God says, He that loveth father or mother more than me 
is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. One thing that I have noticed after coming into this truth is that there is going to be a schism between family members and friends. I remember this one instance with my mother, for instance. Um, as I was changing my diet and God was convicting me on being vegan, my mother is uh, from Barbados. And in, if you've ever been there, uh, there's a lot of, you know, nice Caribbean food, flying fish and whatnot. But I had to give up the fish, had to give up the fish. That was a little schism in the family as well. But the second thing was the cheese. And in Barbados, there is a type of cheese called vegetarian cheese. And then there's a regular cheese, and it's a block type of cheese. But I would always eat this and think, okay, this is good, this is good, it's vegetarian. But then something hit me. What the world calls vegetarian, people still eat dairy. So I got wise one day and I read the package. So I read the package and it said pasteurized milk and some other stuff. So I don't know why it's called vegetarian cheese, but it's still real cheese. So when I saw that, <laughs> I decided I'm not gonna eat this cheese anymore. So one day we go over to my cousin's house, my mother's cousin, and there's a lot of good food on the table. And in the middle was what we call macaroni pie. And that is really good. <laughs> but it had that cheese. I knew it had that vegetarian cheese. And so I'm there getting my plate, and I'm getting everything else, you know, kind of going around the circle, except the mac and cheese. And my mom's there in the kitchen, and she's looking, she's like, oh, Jared, come get some mac and cheese. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, she said, uh, she said, Jared, get some, get some mac and cheese. It's a uh, vegetarian cheese, I mean, vegan cheese. Uh, Mom, that's not vegan cheese. <laughs> And I did not get the mac and cheese. And of course, you know, she's a little mad after that. But I remember this scripture. And I remember that there must be a stand that needs to be taken if you are going to live for God. Amen. There may be a schism if you hold to the principles of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Amen. So now, as we're talking about being in the present truth, we're going to ask now, what advice would you give to someone who is persecuted by their loved ones for being in the present truth? Because many of us are struggling with this thing. We're being persecuted, and we feel like Elijah. We don't see the 7,000. How are we going to stand? How are we going to make it? What advice would you give? Um, the advice that I would give for someone who might be persecuted by their family members or their family members saying, don't go to that church, you're being fanatic with these new principles that you're um, learning, is to simply not listen. That is my advice. <laughs> Do not listen. But there's a biblical reason why. Because when they're persecuting you and saying these words and accusing you, they're carrying the spirit of the accuser. And Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 tells us that the devil is what? The accuser of the brethren. And you want to stay away from that. But I praise God, the principle to not listen comes in James chapter 4 and verse 7. Amen. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do not listen to the temptations of the devil when he tells you that the truth that you're engaging in and this truth that you're learning is false. Don't listen to him. Keep pressing on, reading the word of God. Do not be discouraged because the accuser of the brethren has been cast down ever since Jesus Christ died on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, the advice that I would give to someone that is per being persecuted for choosing to live in this truth and walk the way that God has called them to walk is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. This is a part of the Beatitudes. And Christ says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is an encouragement. If you are persecuted and you know that you are living right by what God has showed you is his standards, the kingdom of heaven will be yours if you continue to stay consistent and faithful. And not only that, but in the book of Mount of Blessings, page 29, paragraph 3, over to page 30, it says, As men seek to come into harmony with God, they will find that the offense of the cross has not ceased. 
principalities and powers, powers and wicked spirits in high places are arrayed against all who yield obedience to the law of heaven. Therefore, so far from causing grief, persecution should bring joy to the disciples of Christ. For it is an evidence that they are following in the steps of the master. And not only that, I have a second witness, which should be an encouragement to see this persecution is not something bad, but something great. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Mm -hmm. So even now you may be persecuted. People may be, you know, trying to do different things to stop you in your tracks as you're seeking to follow Christ. And even Satan himself will send his agents to send fiery darts. We have to be mindful that we must be joyful because Christ went through that and more for us. It's a point zero percent compared to the million percent Christ had to suffer. Mm -hmm. And not only that, as we put on the whole armor of God, we will be able to stand and one day it will cease. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I guess I could say when I was being persecuted, you know, because of certain things that were going on, I was just like, well, Lord, I don't know what to do. You know, I just feel so down and distraught. But I had to keep in my mind, you know, the song that goes, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Hope thou in God, who is the health of thou countenance. And I'm just thinking, I'm just like, Lord, you know, I feel so down and out right now. I don't know what to do. My family is against me. I have nothing. I feel like I'm just nowhere, but I have to remember that I have a God that is there for me at all points in times. And whenever I'm being persecuted, to remember that he was persecuted just as much as I am. And if even that worse, you know, he had to suffer so much more for each and every single one of us on this earth. And we have to remember that we have something so much greater in store. In Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, it actually says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Let's go down also to verse 21, which also says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Amen. So we have to remember that God, he's waiting for us to overcome these things. And how do we overcome these things? By the word of God. The word of God has every single thing that we would ever need. If you're distraught, turn back to the back of your Bible. Look up in the concordance what words that you're feeling. Take the words that pastor is giving us because they are wise words. Whenever I'm feeling as if I'm saddened or something, I just turn to these words and I look up grieved. If I'm grieved, I just turn to Isaiah chapter 54 verse 6 and find what it says and find comfort in that. Pray back the words that he has given us because once God gives us his words, it becomes life. Also, the advice that I would give is to just to smile, you know. Don't let it bother you because in my experiences, there are many times that when I would evangelize and I'd ask someone, I'd scout someone to ask, would you like to do an interview? They'd just look at me and say, why should I give you an interview? Who are you? Why are you just walking up to random people and different things like that? And you know, when you look back once again at Christ's experience, there's a lot of people that said all kinds of things to him. They spat on him and they rejected him and different things like that. But although Christ was sad, that didn't let, he didn't let that bring him down, bring, make him unfocused. He kept going. And so that's just the advice that I would give and just to continue to keep your mind focused because that as well will also help it not to get to you. Amen. And lastly, on that point, what advice would you give to someone struggling with accepting the present truth is John chapter 16, verse 33. There, Jesus tells us, these things I have spoken unto you. In the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world 
So Christ promises we're going to have peace, but he also says there's going to be tribulation. However, because I overcame, if you trust in me, you will also overcome. So knowing that Christ went through it and that as I'm going through it, I have to believe in Christ because he is going to give me the power to overcome if I believe. Amen? Amen. So we've talked about so far being in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what our experiences have been in uh, local Seventh-day Adventist churches, as well as our transition to accepting the present truth. And finally, we're going to talk about our last subject for the evening, which is being in full-time ministry and how God is saving us and calling us to service. And everyone here, I believe, and I know, has a testimony. God has called you from someplace, and he wants you to share your testimony with someone else. As you read Ministry of Healing, it talks about that sharing your testimony is the, the best way to share the gospel. It connects with people. And so what we want to do is to inspire other young people as well as adults to answer the call so that we can finish the work and go home. Amen? Amen. So just to reiterate once again, we are a group called Tell It to the World, and we interview people in various places, asking them about current events, sharing with them the gospel, and we funnel the questions down so that they receive some word of truth before we leave them. So I'm going to let everyone up here explain what is your primary position in full-time ministry and how has full-time ministry affected your life? My primary position within Tell It To The World is a scouter and a producer. And my main role as a producer is to make sure that all the bags of books are packed and ready to pass out, all the literature is within there, as well as make, keeping up with the inventory, making sure we don't run out of resources. And also how that has affected my life. It has shown me that, you know, I have to, as I'm doing this work, it's shown me that I continually have to have a foundation in Christ because it's no use going out there and saying, oh, okay, well, I'm better than this person because I'm a Christian. I go to church every Saturday and you're just out here doing whatever. It's not like that. Yes, I may be in a different place in my life, but I'm still growing each and every day. And that's something I have to keep in mind because I'm being, God is using me as an example to those people to show that this is where I once was, this is where he's brought me, and he can do the same for those people as well. Um, my position in Tell It to the World is an interviewer, um, and it's actually harder than it sounds when you think about it. You are meeting people, you're asking them questions that are quite controversial, and they may say things where you find yourself having to hold back. And the way that being in full-time ministry and doing this position has affected me, we can find, for me, the answer is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And this is Christ speaking. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that's something that I've been really, you know, learning still till now is denying of self. It's very hard, but it's only hard because we make it hard. And I know many of us can say that, you know, it's, we think it's hard to deny ourselves, to say no to the flesh or say no to wanting to speak back. But I see that God has placed me in the position as an interviewer to groom that bad characteristic in me of you know selfishness of wanting to say something or think of myself first and you know as I speak to people and sometimes they may say something that to me is like completely crazy I'm just like what like but in my in my face I'm just like and in my mind I'm like what are you saying but the Lord has has told me to deny myself not speaking to let his word speak for me because when we give this as literature the Holy Spirit will teach them what is true the Holy Spirit will move upon the heart it's not up to me to do the work of the Holy Spirit Amen. Um, for me, I'm a scouter and a producer, and as a scouter, we are the um, first face that the people meet. We're the ones who ask if they want to do an interview and bring them to the interviewers. Now, I felt very unfit for my job, being that I had a very shy personality. I did not like going up to strangers. And because of that, when I would go up on the field, I would have a lack of confidence. I, when I would go up and t talk to people, I would speak at such a low tone that the people would give up on listening to me and I would let countless of people pass me by. 
And at the end of the day, I would feel so guilty. I'd be like, man, look at all these souls that I let pass by me. And because of myself, my weakness, I was not able to speak to them. And they were not able to receive the gospel that day. But I had to learn that what Ministry of Healing, page 102, paragraph 2 says is true. And it says, the gospel invitation is not to be narrowed down and presented only to a select few who we suppose will do us honor if they accept it. The message is to be given to all. And that speaks to me. I have no right to choose, pick and choose who to ask. Like, let's say this certain person looks like they're going to say yes, so I'm going to go to them. Or this person looks like they're going to reject me, so I'm not going to ask them. I don't have the right to do that because everyone deserves the opportunity to the gospel. And that took, I had to learn self-denial. And one of the scriptures that I prayed daily was 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, where Paul says, I die daily. And that was my prayer. Every day I was like, Lord, please scout through me. Help me to die and scout through me because when I'm on the field, I tremble before these people. I am not able to speak to them. But because you are God, you are able to empower me. And through that power, I'm able to speak to them. And even to this day, that's what I carry with me, that the message is to be given to all. That's what's in my head every time I go and ask a person for an interview. Amen. Well, I am actually the videographer for Tell It to the World. I'm the one that mans the camera. Well, woman's the camera. I don't know. And I um, basically record the video so that they could be edited, put together, and then posted on YouTube. And it actually helped to strengthen my spiritual life in a sense because being that at first I did start off as a scouter, you know, but then one day Brother Powell had to drive the van and they're just like, Jeremy, take over the camera. So from then I was just like, wow, Lord, you really did call me to do this work because I saw my deficiencies. I don't know if you guys saw some of the videos, but some of the shaky videos, the dark videos, the blurry videos, that was me. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I can truly tell you that the Holy Spirit does know how to teach. And once you're willing to listen, you take counsel, you will learn in advance because I started to learn and I'm just like seeing Lord, you know, make up for my deficiencies because I don't know what I'm doing. I never took any classes. I didn't learn, but you have taught me and I'm praising God for that. And I'm seeing that it's a continual thing, a continual growth. I've never arrived, but I'm still growing. And one thing is that when I see that, I'm just like, Lord, okay, I don't know how to focus this camera right now. I don't know why it's taking so long. I don't want the soul to be passed by. I want them to receive it. And I'm praying in my heart. I'm just like, Lord, help me. And I remember the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And I didn't really understand that, but as I understand this verse, it's when I see that my weakness has completely and totally availed, his strength is there for me to help me on that time. And I also take that in accordance with Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse, verse 14. No, verse actually, verse, verse 10 where it says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. And as I'm seeing this, I'm just like, okay, God, you've called me to do this work. Now it's my duty to do it to the best of my abilities and not to, dis not to disappoint you in any means. And my position in Tell It to the World is the field supervisor as well as a supervisor for the production department. And the way this has affected my life is in the past, oftentimes I wouldn't write things down. When it came to presentations, when it came to speaking, when it came to anything of that sort, I wouldn't write anything down. I just get ready for the moment and I just speak. And the way this has affected my life is because as a field supervisor, we have checklists and we have uh, I have to make sure that we have the right books, make sure that we have everything in line to be able to go out on the field. And having to have all these checklists, what I have learned through this work and about myself, that I am forgetful. And the Bible says that forgetfulness is sin. And I praise God from bringing, I'm sorry, Spirit of Prophecy says that forgetfulness is sin. I praise God for putting me in this position because Jesus Christ knew exactly where I lacked the most. And it's beautiful because Desire of Ages, um, page 291, paragraph 4, 
says the Savior knew the character of the men whom he had chosen. All their weaknesses and errors were open before him. He knew the perils through which they must pass, the responsibility that would rest upon them, and his heart yearned over these chosen ones. Jesus Christ choos chose the disciples even though he knew their weaknesses and their weak points, and he brought them in to make them grow stronger. And that's the beauty of full-time ministry, because although you might be lacking in something, God will require you to tax the mind so that you may become perfect in your Christianity. And of course, my primary position in full-time ministry, I am also an interviewer. And that has really affected my life in positive ways. I thank God for being there because Ministry of Healing 102.3, it says this. It says, it is in working to spread the good news of salvation that we are brought near to the Savior. So as God has put me in that position, I have been seeing how God is drawing me closer to him. It causes you to want to pray more, to want to study more, and to be ready to give an answer for what you believe. Um, Briefly, there was a man downtown, maybe you saw the video, there was a homosexual man that interviewed me, and at the end of that interview, he said, he asked, how do I know, no, he said, are homosexuals um, going to hell? And I said, I know that there's tact in spreading the gospel. So what I said was that there, God is not going to save people in their sins, whether you're lying stealing, homosexual, whatever it may be, God can give you the power to have victory over sin. So whatever sin it is, God can give you the victory. And he was like, all right. And he, I saw that he perked up. He took the literature, and I was just praising God because he has those seeds sown. So briefly, amen. So, br <laughs> so briefly, we're going to go around and ask, is there a biblical example of what you do as tell it to the world, and how is that relevant to the gospel? I'm going to start. Um, as interviewers, Jermon and I, we represent the word of God. As we're in the field, that is what we represent. Um, because the word of God is to, in John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word is to sanctify us. And we are like the sower in the parable. We meet people on all different types of grounds. We don't know which ground they're on, but we pray that the, the seeds that we have sown will spring up and bear fruit. And as for us in the production department, uh, the biblical example um, is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 and verse 3, where it says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. With loving kindness have I drawn thee. In each and every single one of our lives, since we were children, the Holy Spirit has been drawing us and drawing us until that point that we receive the truth as it is in Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is, in a sense, the work that we do on the field. We go out on the field and we're the first people that the interviewee, the potential interviewee meets and we attempt to draw them into the truth. As Jared mentioned, as the interviewers, um, in a sense, will represent the word. We draw them into the word of God so they might receive the gospel. And as I was being, a, being that I'm a videographer, I started to wonder, I was just like, Lord, what am I doing? I felt as if I myself wasn't doing ministry, as if I wasn't reaching people. But as I read the word of God, I'm understanding the sense of a witness. So I guess you could say that videography plays the role of a witness. Now, what is a witness? Let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. And it actually says, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So what witness we see here is a person that has seen something or a person that has heard something. Even to add to that, someone that has had a personal experience and they're sharing it with others. So I myself don't have, well, I myself, I may not 
be the only person on this earth to go and share everything that I've seen, I've heard of God's goodness. We are all witnesses, but also in the sense of videography, when I'm recording that within itself, a witness, the person receiving the truth and the person seeing what God is doing in their lives. And oftentimes when I go on YouTube and I scroll down and I'm seeing those other witnesses, people saying, praise God for this, because they're seeing that the, the declension, the spiritual declension in this world, seeing how people don't understand what's going on and how we as an Adventists have to step up and share the truth that we have. Yes. And the last department that we have as Tell It To The World is the editing department. Now, we do not edit the videos. They're in the back doing the audio visual right now. But the work of the editing department is very crucial. It's very crucial. Because as I was, um, we were doing worship one day, and we were talking about one of the videos that we had done. And I just remember that there was a lot of mess ups that day on the field. But then we watched the video, and it turned out really good. And the Holy Spirit put in my mind, that is the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that after we have done our best, he covers us with his righteousness. Amen. And in the book of Zechariah chapter 3, we see that Joshua had on these filthy garments. And the devil was talking about him, saying that you have on filthy garments. You're not worthy. But then Christ took off those filthy garments and put on a robe of righteousness, a change of raiment. And so even all of us, after we have done our best in the Christian walk, we've followed the word of God and done everything according to his will, Christ still has to make up our lack so that when the Father sees us, he doesn't see us. He sees Christ's righteousness, Christ living through us. Amen. Amen. So we're going to close on this um, last question. What are some of the memorable moments that you have had while doing full-time ministry? Now, one of the most memorable moments doing full-time ministry is meeting a man named Jeremiah James. I remember meeting him. Um, he was, he was, it was one of our earlier videos, and um, I interviewed him. And the one, the one of the questions that were asked was, what do you think about Pope Francis' proposal for his solution for climate change, which was a national, which was a national Sunday law? And Jeremiah James, he said, I completely and entirely would reject to that proposal. Now, this man was not Seventh-day Adventist, but he said out of his own mouth, this sounds like the work that the Antichrist would do. Now, this, that moment encourages me to continue in this work of evangelism because there are people out there who, who have missing pieces to the puzzle of the truth that God would have for them. And it's our job to go out there and make that puzzle whole to give them the full picture, this full spectrum. And on that day, hopefully, I pray, when the mark of the beast is implemented, that those people who have received the truth through Tell It to the World, through the various forms of evangelism that all of us might do, that they will stand and they will remember, that person spoke to me. That person gave me the great controversy. I read in that book, and everything in that book is coming into fruition right now, and they will stand for God. That encourages me to work and continue in this work in evangelism, and I hope this testimony encourages you to be and continue in evangelism. Amen. One of the most memorable moments for me doing Tell to World I have a few, but I'm going to give one. Um, I'm trying to think which one I should give. I, um, recently, we went to California, and we were in Los Angeles. We were on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and we were you know, doing interviews. And a lot of people that we interviewed, they pretty much most of the people we interviewed, they you could tell that they were oblivious to what is going on in the world. But there was a man that Jeff had scouted for me, and his name was Joseph. And as I was interviewing him, I began to ask him about why people stop attending church and things of that sort. And he goes to me, he says, they stop attending church because there's a whole bunch of lies. You know, they're um, under the government, so they can't speak. And the whore Babylon, she's the one that has all these churches. Do you know who these churches are? The Protestants of America. They're the 
an image and God says, come out of her, my people, come out of her. And I'm just like, praise the Lord, like in my heart. I'm like, yes, yes. You know, but I'm interviewing him just straight face like, wow this guy like he knows this truth and it was such a blessing like I can't even explain the feeling that I had and I was just I was my if you watch the video I you know suggest watching our videos just to see how God you know is not just using us but using the people around us as well to be a witness it it was a blessing for that that was an encouragement to me because no matter where we go we seem to find that one or that two that know some type of truth and that encourages me that we have to go out all of us that are here the more people that go out the more of us that share this truth the more souls that we could win for God and you know I want to have many stars in my crown I don't know about you but I want my I think to have so much that I have to hold the rest of my hand. I just put my crowns and my stars at the feet of Jesus and say, God, all you, because it was not me. So it's encouraging. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, what I want to share, one account that I had that impacted me was when we went to the campus of UCF in Florida, and I was interviewing this young man, and that day it was, um, I think it was a little discouraging because we were searching for people. We couldn't get a lot of people. People were saying, no, you know, it's hot outside. But then I was met, led to this young man named uh, Alejandro. And as I was talking with him, he began to share his testimony as I was speaking about what is sin and the errors of the Roman Catholic Church as it relates to uh, confessionals and um, so on and so forth. I was talking with him and literally he began to say every single thing that was on my cue card. And I was praising the Lord for that because it was as though God had taken the words off the cue card and put it into his mind. And he was sharing, he was seven years old and he was in the Roman Catholic Church. And at the age of seven, he realized this is error. How can I confess to another man who is also a sinner and get forgiveness? It didn't make sense. He asked his mom, if I die today, would I go to heaven? Would I go to hell? She couldn't even give him an answer from the Bible. She said, go to a priest. And he was fed up. So he left the Roman Catholic Church. And he was sharing with me, he was led to read the King James Version of the Bible. Amen? Amen. The King James Version. And he said the first book that he read was the book of Revelation. Amen. Now, I'm not sure how much he understood, but praise the Lord that God was touching him because he was captivated as he was speaking with me. He was very encouraged. And I was praising God for that experience because all that I had on the paper, I mean, he was saying it. And I was just blessed to see that God does have people that are in these churches. He has people that are in the world and he's just waiting for us to go and to find them. He says in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. They're God's people. We just have to go and call them out. And all we have to do is sow the seeds. Again, we don't know what type of ground they're on. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground, or the good ground. We just have to sow the seed, and God is going to do the rest. Amen. And now this quote in Ministry of Healing, page 99, paragraph 1. It says, speaking about the demoniac, this is found in the chapter entitled, Save to Serve in the book Ministry of Healing. But they could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the Savior's power. This is what everyone can do. How many? Everyone. Does that include you? Yes. Does that include me? Yes. Even those online, that includes all of us. This is what everyone can do whose heart has been touched by the grace of God. This is the witness which our Lord calls and for want of which the world is perishing. So we have to rescue these souls who are perishing. And how are we going to do it? By sharing our testimony in connection with the word of God. Amen? Amen? So we encourage you as God is and has been and is continuing to save us. And we know that he's doing the same for you because you are here. Go and serve others, bringing them to the kingdom. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to share our testimony. Because we know that as we share our testimony, it will connect with someone. They would see God lived out in us. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We are not worthy to be here, 
We are not worthy to do your work, none of us. But you have called us, wretched as we are. We pray that as you put a change of garment on Joshua in the book of Zechariah chapter 3, we pray that you would do the same for us as well. Thank you for your blessings. Continue to tabernacle with us as we continue the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.